Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 804, with my guest today, Master Kelly Thomas. Who am I? I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where all that we do is in support of traditional martial arts and traditional martial artists, probably someone like you. If you want to know all the stuff that we've got going on, there's a great place to start. It's whistlekick.com. That's where we have our store. We have links to all the various projects that we have going, the other websites that might be relevant. And in the store, you're going to find all kinds of great stuff from protective equipment to apparel, upcoming registrations for events, training programs. And if you use the code podcast15, podcast15, it's going to save you 15% on darn near everything that's in there. If you haven't been in a while, we're adding new stuff all the time. Even the sweatshirt I'm wearing just rolled out, I think, three weeks ago as of this recording. Now, if you want to go deeper on the show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go. We bring you two episodes each and every week, the purpose being to connect, educate, and entertain all of you traditional martial artists out there. It's one of the best things that we do, and yeah, it's free, but if you want to support us, yeah, you could buy something, you could attend an event. There are a lot of things you could do, but here are the big three that we ask for. You could leave us a review somewhere. Uh, could be on Spotify could be on Apple Podcasts, just some manner review somewhere. That's number one. Number two, we have a Patreon. If you like the stuff that we put out, well, you can get access to more stuff that you're not going to find anywhere else. Bonus content, as well as merch that comes at the various levels. It starts at two bucks a month. And number three, you could check out the family page, whistlekick.com slash family. It's a kind of a mini Patreon. There's a bunch of bonus behind the scenes stuff that we put in there, as well as all the ways that you can help us in our mission to connect, educate, and entertain. And why is that our mission? Because we believe that traditional martial arts brings out the best in people. If we got everybody in the world to train, what would happen? Well, it would be a much better world. And that's why we do what we do. Now, in today's episode, we have a conversation between myself and Master Kelly Thomas, someone who has made a lot of lives better, who has taught a huge number of people, especially when you consider the population that we have here in Vermont. I've known her for years, but it's really only been over the last few years that I've gotten to know her much better and proud to call her a friend and very honored, very thankful that she was willing to come on. Uh, one of the things we said as we were ending kind of off air that I think is worth sharing here, we had a, a much deeper conversation because I knew who she was and because she trusted me, right? Most of the guests that we have on the show don't know who I am or they don't know me well. I spent plenty of time with Kelly and her family and I think the world of her. And while it's going to be unlikely that this show ever changes in that way, that most of the people that come on are people I know well, it's fun for me to have that sort of contrast and bring someone on that I know some of their story and I know who they are, but I don't know all the details. And that's what we get into today. So I hope you enjoy it. Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. What's going on? Oh, not too much. <laughs> Just same old, same old, right? We always yeah. say that, but we know that's yeah. a lie. <laughs> it is a lie. You've got a lot going on. Oh, yeah. Yes, that keeps us young, baby. They say something. busy at least. Busy, keeps us yes. from getting bored, if nothing else. That's true. Being bored sometimes doesn't sound so bad until you're bored. <laughs> right. Being bored, being bored is good for like for me anyway for like five minutes. Yes, and then, yes. And then I'm bored of being bored. Yep. And then I and then, need to go do something. Then the wheels start turning again, right. and you come up with more projects to do. Oh, oh, for sure. Being bored is dangerous <laughs> in that way. How's your recovery? How's your, it was knee, right? Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. going well. It's going well. It's two months out now. Okay. So, you know, it'd still be a, a while, but. What can you do and can't you do? Um, I can walk without a cane now. Okay. I can walk without limping if I think really hard about it, just because okay. I'd limp for so long that sure. the body shuffles. Um, I can't kick yet. You know, um, I can't bring the leg up at 90 degrees yet or anything like that, but I can stand on it for a little bit. And so that'll pivoting still makes me nervous. Mm, understandable. But now you've had, it, you've had joint replacement before, but this is your first knee. Correct. I've had three hips, three hips, all the same side or two and one, uh, two on one side. Cause the first hip they did end up being recalled. 
like a car part. Same type of uh, you, letter. Do you, you get, get a little postcard in the mail? Yes. <laughs> We're sorry to inform you, but your hip has been recalled. Okay, then. <laughs> oh, it's got to be brutal. And and I think I heard you say somewhere along the line that the recovery on this was way different. It was much more intense. It was much more intense and uh, it did permanent damage. Really? Yeah. So it's like I don't have a hip flexor on that side. Okay. So, you know, I can't bring that leg up to a 90 degree. So I, I really can't kick with that leg either. Uh -huh. So, you know, you just fake it till you make it, I guess, and right. use a loud voice. <laughs> <laughs> And you and you got to get the stare down because you want them to, to think you can still do things. Well, you've got you've not. got kids, so you've got that stare. I've never yeah. met a mom who doesn't have that stare. Yeah, but it's funny the adults will get it too. You know, sure, because we've I all had it. moms that gave us that stare. <laughs> I know. I made a grown man like squeal the other day, which was awesome. <laughs> what, what was he doing that he shouldn't have been doing? Oh, he was, we were just kind of talking about, you know, sparring and how somebody was like, well, how do you do it? You know, when the person is so much taller than you. And I'm like, guys, I'm five foot. Everybody was taller than me. I said, right. you just, you know, have them kick and you've got to go in, you know, you block and you go in and you just got to be fast. And I said, the thing about tall people is they're not used to having somebody in their face. Right. So it totally freaks them out. And so he was the tallest guy in the class. And I said, you know, come on up, Trent. I said, you know, can't move as you know too fast but you know throw a kick well sure. apparently i moved fast enough i blocked him was in and he was like whoa <laughs> i was like that's, <laughs> isn't that, you know, then he wanted me to do it to his son and i said no that was questions we're gonna leave that alone <laughs> you know i love it you know but it's true they're not used to having people in their face yeah because everybody gives tall people well you know i, I do i do because yeah. everybody's taller than me yes you know so I, I feel quite confident when I spar someone my height. It's, it's almost, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's comparatively much simpler. It's like, oh, yes. oh, because <laughs> I have flexible hips. So my, I, I tell people you have to spar me like I'm six foot yeah, because I, I can, I've got reach with my legs and people don't, yeah. if they don't do that. Then yeah. That's why like, you know, in tournaments, I always hated the stupid head bop, you know, yeah. that they, they started allowing and yeah, yeah. I had uh, Ian, I think you've met Ian, bushy yep. hair, Ian. Yep. He went to Snyder's there and I, I wasn't there, but I got to um, watch the fight. The guy is like a foot taller than him and kept head bopping him. I'm yeah. like, really? There's like no skill there. No, so, but uh, it, it is what it is. It is. <laughs> it is. So we're going to talk about a, a, a bunch of stuff today. I know, you know, we've, I know you. I know you better than I know most guests that come on the show. So it gives me a little bit of opportunity to to kind of dance around and we can talk about some different things. But the place I want to start, because I don't know the answer to this. I, I I think I've heard bits, but how you got started. Um, I got started. And so I have to put a disclaimer because okay. you had me on the show once before and I was so nervous. I messed up all my dates. So these are actually the true dates. Okay. <laughs> so I wrote them down. Because we, we had you on... When we were talking about the adaptive stuff, right? I had, Correct. We did. I think it was kind of like almost a two part. I had Jason on, and we talked about the organization. You've done some work with the Adaptive Martial Arts Association, right? And you're like, oh, so how did you start? I'm like, oh my god, I wasn't prepared for that. Um, <laughs> well, we can pretend so, that didn't exist, and so we'll, just, we'll pretend we'll it didn't exist. Light. So um, I started in uh, 1981. I was 11, um, and my dad wanted me to have um, some self defense classes. He was one that um, I grew up on a dairy farm and he had the um, attitude that as a woman to uh, succeed or participate in a man's world, you had to know how to fight and work like a man. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where the self-defense piece came in. And he, I believe, was selling insurance at the time. And one of his uh, clients was um, Rick Dion. Mm -hmm. who had a Taekwondo school. And so that's how I got started. What I find most interesting about that is if we go back to 1981, not that I remember 1981, I was barely alive. Thanks. But <laughs> you, know, you got a couple years on me, not a lot, but you got a couple. And the, the 
there's something I've always found interesting because it, it it shows up periodically in episodes. This idea that okay, self defense exists. It is a thing. It is a thing that can be learned. It is a thing I want my kid to learn. And martial arts classes are a way to do that. That was not common then. So do you have a sense as to how he connected those dots and understood it well enough that he wanted you to participate? I'm not sure because honestly, back then, I don't remember doing a lot of so-called self-defense. Sure. You know, as opposed to just, you know, learning how to spar and how to kick and i think with him talking to um who became grandmaster dion you know grandmaster dion's like well you know they learn how to kick and you can you know and, and defend yourself because i don't think self-defense was really necessarily on the radar mm -hmm. as much like you said okay. it was just sort of like you know you're learning how to kick and punch and block well that's self-defense mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's sort of how that all got started. Okay. And 11 is, is I mean, you know, because you have a school, 11 is not a common age that people start. No. In, in, in some schools, it's more common than others. And I would say it's more common now than it was for a while. Was it something that you took to right away? I loved it. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, I had a low self-esteem. Um, and didn't have many friends and was really a tomboy. And I came into a small town where everybody was related mm. and they had been to school together forever. So I was the outcast yeah. and wanting to, a girl wanting to play with the boys was not really acceptable. And yeah. the fact that I grew up on a farm and was often late to school because farm chores had to be done. Yep. um before school and so I'd go and smell like the barn and so it was just I didn't really fit in there but then at the the taekwondo school everybody there was supportive and being a, a strong loud girl was okay mm -hmm. um and and it felt great um it was different because um my brother who trained with me as well my father later joined us we were the only kids in class. So that was really unique too. Yeah, there were quite a few schools that didn't have any kids' classes. In fact, I don't know that I would say kids' classes were rare, but they certainly weren't the norm from my right. understanding of the early 80s. How long after, you, did you start with your brother at, together? You started at the same time? I, yeah, we started at the same time. Um, and then, uh, my dad would watch like so many parents do. And he finally said, well, this is ridiculous. I may as well do it. How, so, how long after did he join? I'd say probably six months okay. of watching. And so my brother and I were the youngest and my dad was the oldest in class. Okay. And, you know, because I know you teach a lot of families now, so I bet you've looked back and, you know, on that dynamic and how it impacted your family. How did it? impact your family what was it like for the three of you sharing that experience um it was great uh it's probably my favorite um childhood memory we used to do a lot as a family because we had the farm but as far as going on we didn't do family vacations mm. we didn't go to the movies there wasn't time right. you know but there was two hours a week that we would go and not do farm chores um, and so that was really, was really fun. Mm. Okay. So 11 and you're going, you're going, what was the next, if we can call it milestone or interesting point that we might talk about on your journey there? Um, well, with being on a farm, we kind of came and went. Um, mm -hmm. I think I got to blue belt as a kid and then we had to stop. Mm. And so that was probably, I'd probably done it for a couple of years. And then um, was going to UVM and a soft, as a sophomore there, I saw a flyer that said there was a Taekwondo club. And I'd always missed it mm. and didn't necessarily realize how much I missed it until I saw the flyer. And I thought, well, 
I'll go give it a try, which was big for me because I really am a shy person. Mm -hmm. And to walk into this room where I wouldn't have known anybody, but my desire to check it out, out, you know, outbid or out won my discomfort. And the interesting thing was when um, I went into UVM, it was being taught by um, uh, Master Joe Shields. And Joe Shields was an a student of Grandmaster Dion. So even though all these years had passed, I never left that that home base. Mm-hmm. And did you have kind of the same experiences when you had started before that you just took to it and it was just a, oh, yeah. a, a refuge? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was just, it. you know, martial arts people, we're a unique bunch. And there are certain things that, you just gravitate to each other towards, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you like the, you like the push, you like uh, be able to push your body um, to find out where, you know, how far can you go? Um, You push the, the spirit, you know, there are days you don't feel like going and, and you go anyways. And you, you walk through the door and all of a sudden you feel better. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't seem, at least not to me, doesn't happen anywhere else except you know, in a school, in a martial arts location. Um, and, you know, we got along great. Um, UVM uh, still has a, a great program going on. Back at the time, they had these um, living dorm, they called living and learning. Mm-hmm. And um, there would be suites and suites could be uh, a certain topic. Okay. And there was actually a Taekwondo suite. And we had like the top four (laughs) and it was wild. I mean, you just had to be, you didn't know when you were going to walk in. There might be throwing stars. Um, (laughs) We had to do a lot of um, wall fixing before Uh, we left. I can imagine. You know, I mean, board breaking everywhere. You know, you get, uh, you know, somebody be knocking on your door at midnight. We're going to spar. Let's go. And we find like a a spare room. I love it. I'm still in, in contact with many of them, and if they're not involved in martial arts, their kids. Mm. So, um, you know, it really had an impact on on everybody. Yeah. Okay. So, I guess you said sophomore year, so three years. Three years, and then. Yeah. Um. So as uh, I also. I, have this habit of um injuries and as a red belt um i actually tore my acl Oof. which so back then would have been in like 1990 and acl repairment is not like it is now right um they told me like no taekwondo or anything for like a year which was as a red belt just about kills you yeah um and uh so i I had to do some back off and do a little bit of training and whatnot. I would still go. I probably did not wait a year. I'm guessing I did not. Um, and uh, so I continued to train with UVM program mm-hmm. and we would, because um, Joe Shields was a student of um, Grandmaster Dion, whenever we would have testings, the Dions would come. Mm-hmm. Um, at this time, um, there was uh, Grandmaster Dion. Uh, and Lori Dion, his wife. So it was a husband and wife team that were running the schools. So they would both come and, you know, do our do our testings and watch us test. And I, I was the point person because I knew them to call and mm. schedule, you know, when they would come and stuff. And I was on the phone with her and things were just totally out of control. And she's like, oh, I've got so much to do. She says, you know, I really could use a secretary. She's like, what are you doing? <laughs> so I well so she ended up hiring me um to work at their school oh okay and uh so um I was sort of behind the person uh one making the phone calls and doing the sort of the book work um all behind the scenes and uh and I got my black belt from them in 92 okay so I took the long yeah 11 yeah. years it took a long, long way. <laughs> a lot of scenic was, was, some, was Yeah, some detours in there. Yeah, uh, injuries, you know, all those kinds of things. And yeah. But. 
do you think you appreciated it more because of those detours? I think so. The biggest thing that I know now is because I had all those detours that I was able to train as a young child, train as a college student, which I mean, gosh, that's like the best time. <laughs> and then, you know, train again later. Um, I've been able to experience what training is like for people of all ages. Yeah. And so it allows me to understand i guess mm. and you know plus two what i do is i tell my students it's not a race because sometimes people get you know oh i've missed this testing or i'm not here and i just don't you know how long it took me to get to black belt 11 years and they go oh. and i'm like i said does that make you think less of me and they're like no i said so see it doesn't matter and i said plus you'll probably get there before i did <laughs> and that always makes them feel a little bit better yeah Okay. So your your first job out of college was martial arts related. You know, not, not, a, yes. not a lot of people can say that. And I would assume that that gave you a front row seat and probably dragged you out of your seat at times for training. It did. It did. So I she hired me. I was still in college. Um, I had another full time job besides. OK. Um, and so I think I was only working for her like two nights a week. And uh, once I graduated, I continued to work for her two nights a week. I still had the full-time job at UVM. And then uh, another school hired me for a couple of nights a week. Um, so being, you know, behind the scenes and watching how that all worked was a big part. Um, and then, of course, you know, I would work my shift and then I'd go out for, you know, advanced classes and, and that sort of thing. Okay. A little bit of foreshadowing. I mean, you, you have a school now. Were you thinking of having a school back then? Was that? I wasn't because I was terrified to teach. Ooh. Say more about that. <laughs> so um, I was, well, I probably still am, but I've tried to, to um, calm it down a little bit. I was always a people pleaser mm -hmm. and I never wanted to let anyone down and I never wanted to do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And so teaching to go out there, I was always afraid, especially the warm ups, which is probably like the easiest thing to do. But I'd be afraid like I didn't do it right. Mm -hmm. I had it in my head, you know, my instructors did it a certain way. So I was supposed to do it a certain way. Yeah. And to the point where um, once I got my black belt and sometimes Mrs. Diane would be busy with with uh, students or whatever and class was supposed to start. And I knew she was going to be looking for somebody to start class. I would actually hide in the bathroom mm. and wait until I heard somebody else starting class before I would go out. Now, I think I've heard you say this before. And I think the next point is she caught on. She did. She did. She waited for me once and then sent me out there. Yeah, you didn't get much by her for very long. <laughs> Um, but what I found, which was interesting, once I, you know, warmed up class, we had a Saturday morning class that the Dians didn't attend. They just let, you know, whoever it was run it. And that person was getting done. And I volunteered to do that class because I felt that I would be more comfortable doing it on my own when I didn't have them like staring um, at me. Um, the Dians were a really big part of my life. Um, Mrs. Dian is basically, you know, I consider her a big sister. Um, Grandmaster Dian was probably like an uncle. And so, you know, for me, it was it was a more than just an instructor um, student relationship. So it was like a lot of extra pressure for me. Yeah. Um, and because they had done so much for me, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to let them down. I'd always be like, well, a new student came in and if I said the wrong thing, and I laughed. And, you know, how do you you know, how do you correct that? You, right. you don't, um, you know, when you're when you're in that situation, you're so afraid of doing something like that yep. um but i decided to take over uh saturday mornings and that's where i really started to love what i love mm. teaching because you know i could do it my way and it wasn't that much different but i felt like i was on my own and i could do it that mm. you didn't have the pressure of them there observing right. you and and you know i think most of us can relate to that that pressure and you know what it sounds like is you were applying pressure 
that probably wasn't there, you know, they were observing, they wanted to make sure you did it right. But, you know, just as I'm sure you watch your students now, they'd probably rather you not be in the room while you're right. observing them. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that you're you're standing there staring them down and uh, nitpicking every little thing. Most of the time, there are times where that's appropriate, right. but most of the time you just want to see them succeed. Right. So you're teaching Saturdays and it's going well and you're kind of finding your way. Did that change your thoughts on, oh, maybe this is something I want to do in the future in a bigger way? So I think probably when I got my second um, degree black belt, uh, I started thinking that uh, my goal was to get to be a master and to own my own school. Okay. And that's sort of where, you know, they were kind of... Um, training me in that direction as well, um, giving me more and more responsibilities, um, teaching more, helping with the kids more, because Mrs. Diane was one to say, if you want to learn how to teach, teach kids, mm -hmm. because they will teach you how to teach. <laughs> you can't get away <laughs> with they, anything. They, no, right. You know, it's like, wait, you did say that last week. It's like, it's okay. It'll be all okay. Um, you know, and you really have to be able to, you know, change on the fly when you've got kids, yeah. because it can go from, you know, everybody's lined up nice to trying to um, organize Jello. That's a very that's fast. Great analogy, organizing Jello. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you know, I had done some um, competing and stuff all the way through, and you know, being with being like their secretary or you know right hand person, I got to meet a lot of the you know, masters of the time and establish a relationship there and kind of see how things were going. And so it really helped me feel like there was more to the martial arts community than just the school and that I wanted to be able to do it as well, you know, add mm -hmm. myself into that formula. Sure, sure. What were the people around you, your, let's say your non-martial arts peers, if there were any at that time, because you know, here you are, sounds like 22, 23, 24, opening a martial arts school, not just at that time, but at that age, isn't something that's super common. And I'm wondering if the people around you understood why it was important. Yeah. Well, I didn't actually open up my own school until much later. It was just sort of in my head. Sure. Okay. So you weren't talking about it with anyone? I wasn't really talking. I talked okay. a little bit about it with the Dions because, you know, they knew eventually at some point they would, you know, retire. And, yeah. um, you know, so I continued to work with them and um, had it in the back of my head that, you know, maybe someday that would be the place for me. They had a place in Colchester. Um, and just, you know, kind of continue, but it's hard. Um, when you look at, I was working for UVM, had a nice job, had benefits, um, running a martial arts school, um, no benefits, uh, no guaranteed, you know, salary or anything like that. And it was always kind of hard to, to think about how to balance it all. And like I said, too, it was kind of hard. I'm in my twenties. And so all I'm doing is working and working and training. Yeah. So there's no other life. Um, so wanted to make sure I didn't miss out on everything, um, even though what I, I was doing what I loved. But there was still, you know, some other aspects of life that was needed. Um, but most of my friends were martial artists. Yeah. Um, and yeah. even today. I, I want to take a little bit of a tangent because it's a subject that's come up a bit. Uh, throughout the years and it has to do with women training you know mm. 1981 there were not a lot of women training and even fewer teaching and if, you know I, I I've met well Grandmaster Dion I've not met Mrs. Dion so I don't know what the dynamic between them was back then but I'm going to guess that you know he as the senior rank you know kind of ran classes and, and the culture was a bit more of him than it was of her. And yet when I've heard you talk over the years, you talk much more about her, that you bonded more with her. And so what I, what I wonder is how important was that for you, you know, at 11 and as a teenager and as a 20 something to have that role model, you talked about her as a big sister 
to see another woman in the martial arts and doing something in a way that you could aspire to here. She is, she's, she's teaching. And it was something that you were starting to think you wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so it's funny that you say that you would think that um, Grandmaster Diane would be the one that he oversaw things, but she did most of the teaching. Oh, okay. she really did. She really okay. did. Uh, he would do um, like the black belt classes. He would do some of the advanced classes but because uh, he also had another job, he was a carpenter. Uh, and so he, she ran the schools, basically. They okay. did have two schools. One was in St. Albans um, and one was in Colchester for a long time before they sold the one in St. Albans. Um, but she primarily did all the teaching and um, any of the, you know, the office stuff that I didn't do. Um, you know, she was the the face he was sort of like the head you know he'd walk in and you know he had this way about him that you know he'd walk in and you knew somebody important walked in mm -hmm. you wouldn't know who it was because he had like long hair and wearing flip-flops so definitely not the attire you would expect but you you're you're things. describing my first impression of him as well yeah like, right you know you're just who's like, this who guy with this long guy? hair and flip-flops <laughs> At a time of year when flip flops aren't really appropriate, and everyone <laughs> is just looking at him reverentially, it's like, ooh, yeah, he's somebody. So it, it is somebody, you know. But he never had that air, right? He just sort of it came with him, and so I mean, he was, you know, he was there. He was the he was the grandmaster, um, but she was really, um, you know, the heart um, mm. of the school, and so that was really unique because, like you said, there weren't that many women that had that important role in the martial arts. And so with that, I think that also brought a lot of other women to the school. Yeah. You know, I think women instructors or women school owners, which I still don't think there are a lot, tend to bring in a lot more girls yeah. and women. Um, and uh, cause I think at one point, um, we had like 30 women black belts in the school. Wow. Um, and That's so that cool. was, that was really cool um, to have that, but it was still very hard because felt like you always had to prove yourself, mm -hmm. you know, because you were a woman, you had to prove yourself all the time. And I know she felt that um, a lot of the time, mm -hmm. um, you know, and again, you've got the um, where she's married to the master and so, I mean, there was no, you know, there were no cut in corners, yeah. you know, you, you were out there and that's how I kind of felt too, as you know, her protege or whatever, there was no cutting corners. You know, I, I would, um, you know, when I would go to compete, you know, we'd, we'd tape my pattern, you know, the old fashioned way VHS, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then we wind it and we watch it and she like, dit, 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 dit. and you know, be like do it again and tape it again. Dit, 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 dit. If I hated her as my as my judge because as soon as I'd start, I'd look at her and she'd go. <laughs> <I was just laughs> like, oh. <laughs> you know, but she was hard on me because she knew I could take it, yep. and she knew where I could go. Yep. And um, so sometimes that was hard, um, but now looking back, I do appreciate it um, because. What I discovered as uh, a woman martial artist, a lot of times it's not the men that were the problem. It was the other woman martial artists mm -hmm. at that time. I believe it's changed now. Um, but, you know, um, as a woman, I can say this, um, working with a bunch of women can be really nutty and, <laughs> you know, really catty. Um, and uh, a lot of jealousy, I think, tends to happen whenever you know, you're working with a lot of women or like I said, back then. And that's what I had experienced. Yeah. And you I've know. observed that in and out of the martial arts. I think the healthiest groups have good, strong men and strong women, you know, as you know, in all the ways that you could represent strength as a man and a woman, um, different body types, different energies. I think it and, and you have schools now, so I'm sure you, you've seen it. You've had groups where it's a little more lopsided one way or the other, and it's it's less healthy. Yeah, it's that whole balance thing. Yeah. Okay. 
So, but no, she was, she was a big influence on, you know, what I do now. Sure. sure. Okay. So full-time job, you're in your twenties, you're being raised, groomed to mm -hmm. go and do this. Should you choose? But I also know that, you know, we've, we've made it to maybe mid twenties took a while. And because you opened your school, I think I've heard you say six, seven years ago. Uh, 16. 16 years ago. 16 years ago. Okay. Yeah. Six, right. seven I'm missing years. A one. No, yeah. Well, six, seven years ago, I went full time. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah. then let, let's, let's talk about the, the points in time between, you know, mid twenties and you starting to teach for yourself. So what happened in there? So, um, I was probably, I got my third degree and the Dions were moving. This was probably nine, 98. Yeah. So I was about 28. Dions are leaving. Um, and for some reason, and like I said, everything happens for a reason and it was their business. So it was their decision. They wanted me to stay on as like the secretary person and take care of the books and being the office person. But they felt that um, I wouldn't be able to handle all the teaching as well. Mm. So they started grooming somebody else mm. to start doing the teaching and that we would do it together as partners. Okay. And I wasn't a big fan of that. Um, Why? Partly because the person that was coming in every time he came in complained about having to be there and teach and so you, i you, you know you, and i you're getting better was, as a teacher and you felt yes. like you had this this role set in front of you and they wanted you to work with someone who didn't even want to do it correct Oof. and you know they thought it was way i never said a thing to him because like i said it's their business they want yep. they were retiring they needed to set it up the best way that they thought possible. Yeah. And uh, at the time when I was working at UVM, um, I was approached uh, about a different job that was going to take me into Addison County. And um, they guaranteed me uh, a huge raise, better benefits. And so I decided to go that route. And for folks that aren't local to Vermont, the, we're not talking about a huge move, but we're talking about moving from, quote, the city that Vermont has, um, half hour to 45 minutes south, depending on where in this area we're talking about. Right. And so for me, from here to Colchester, it's about an hour or so. Um, and uh, it was going to be a totally different job. It was a sales job. Um, and so I was going to be on the road all the time and figured that, you know, I needed to give myself the opportunity to do this and let um, the Dions go ahead and 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 do what they were going to do. Yeah. And I was going to stop the martial arts, mm. um, at least that role. I was still hoping to continue to train, um, which I still did. I would still drive up and train once in a while, but it just it wasn't the same. Um, the Dions left. And for me, that was a big you know, other people took over the schools. Um, how much of it, because I feel like I can ask you this question. Yeah. I, I don't want to lose the opportunity. How, because so many of us have experienced this, you know, when, when, when leadership in a martial arts school changes, the, the culture changes, the curriculum changes, it doesn't matter how closely people try to follow it. It's always going to change at least somewhat. How much of your decision to step back, how much of it was the job and the logistics and how much was it that you were hurt the way that they had kind of set things forward. Yeah, I was definitely hurt, um, but I respected them sure. and and I didn't say anything. Um, Mrs. Diane and I spoke about it years later and she wishes now that I had, mm. but I still That you had brought it up? That she wishes that I had. I felt if I did, I would be more like a bratty kid, like, mm. but you promised, you know, and this was a big deal, you know, and they had- you know, it made sense have somebody do this and somebody do this, but it wasn't what I wanted. You know, I didn't want to be at the desk all the time. You know, I wanted to be a big change from the kid who was 
from the, from the, you know, girl who was hiding in the bathroom, you know, I, I love teaching and, you know, molding people and doing that. And since it was no longer what I envisioned myself doing or what my goal was, I was like, okay, well, it's time to shift. Yeah. And so that's what I did. Um, I think I left the school a few months before they left. Um, and of course, like I said, Mrs. Diane and I years later talked. They were also very upset and hurt the fact that I left. Um, and I moved down um, into uh, Addison County and started my new job. Mm. Which in retrospect, this is where I was supposed to end up. So mm. everything happens for a reason, even though feathers can get ruffled a little bit. Yeah. I know what it's like to train occasionally. It can be difficult, you know, especially when you go and, you know, the planets align and you get to go to class and you have a great class and you have a lot of fun and you're driving home and you're going, man, I wish this happened more. I wish this was a bigger part of my life again. How long did you do that? I probably only did it for about a year. Um, on my move down here with my new job, um, I met uh, my first husband. Mm -hmm. And we were deciding to get married. And like you said, it wasn't going to, you know, the Dion school wasn't the same for me anymore. Popping in periodically, you didn't really know anybody. So it just slowly kind of went away. Yeah. Um, as I focus on what I thought was going to be my new direction and new life. So that kind of, you know, getting married, having kids. Um, my first husband was also a dairy farmer. So I went back to, you know, farming, um, you know, and that really kind of like helped kind of screen over that part of me that mm -hmm. I, you know, tried to convince myself wasn't important that this was this other part now was important. Um, and, you know, Taekwondo was in the past and I did what I did, you know, packed everything up. Um, I tell people, uh, you know, I went th th so far as I threw away all my old belts, which I tell people don't do it, you know, but it was my way of cleansing and like, nope, I don't need this stuff anymore. But in actuality, it was more painful for me to see all the time. So I was just like, Chuck it, get rid of it. Mm. Uh, and then see, I can I could toss it. I, I'm all done. I don't have to do Taekwondo anymore or any martial arts. You art thought that it. chapter of your life was done. I really did. And I really did. And I, you know, I I really tried to force that book closed. Mm. But obviously it didn't stay that way. <laughs> when did you reopen it? So um my daughter was five. And um, she was attending uh, a private school. And every Friday, they would have athletic days mm -hmm. because they didn't have gym every day. They just locked off, you know, either, every Friday afternoon to do their athletics. Mm -hmm. And they would bring in special people to do all kinds of different um, athletics. You know, they go play, you know, go skating for the afternoon or they go play basketball somewhere. And um, my daughter who, um, has anxiety every Thursday night would be a panic for mm -hmm. her because she wouldn't know what the athletic was, wouldn't know if she'd be any good at it and didn't know if she'd even like it. So we'd always have to We'd always have to have a big conversation on Thursdays. She came home on Thursday and she said, um, we're doing Taekwondo tomorrow. I was like, what? Because even though I was done, I was kind of looking for a school to enroll my daughter because I knew how great it was. Mm. And I couldn't find a school around here. So I was really kind of curious as to who they had found. Yeah. And so that morning I went in and talked to one of the teachers and I said, I understand you're doing Taekwondo, you know, for athletics. And they said, no, it's Tai Chi. Well, Megan had never heard Tai Chi. She'd only heard Taekwondo. So that's where she kind of got her mixed signals. And they said, actually, they can't do it. And I said, well, I said, years ago, <laughs> prior to children and everything else, I said, I used to be, you know, a black belt in Taekwondo. If you ever are in need of anything, you know, let me know. And they said, what are you doing next week? <laughs> I said, apparently ordering paddles and a shield. Um, they wanted me to come in and, and teach a couple classes for them. Um, it was the end of the school year. So I went in and taught um, 
six classes. Uh, it was three weeks. We broke them up by age. And um, it was really kind of nerve wracking because it was one of those schools where like the teachers were by their first name yeah. and there really wasn't a lot of discipline and there really wasn't a lot of general respect that I would have expected to see from kids because it was just yeah. a totally different idea of teaching, yeah. I guess. And there was especially this one kid that just would roll his eyes no matter what and was just it's like my was, least favorite thing when I teach kids. Right. I know. And it's like, you know, he was just, I felt like he was just such a putz <laughs> and, and I was like, Oh, what am I going to do? Am I going to go in? Cause they all know me as Kelly because I'm Megan's mom. Right. And I said, what am I going to do? And I said, well, they're going to get the whole thing. So I went in and, um, you know, said, um, you know, got everybody lined up. I said, okay, while I'm here teaching, um, I'm, uh, this is good. Uh, I'm master Thomas, you know, and master is my job name, like going to the doctors, you know, it's master Thomas. We're going to bow. We're going to say, yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. And I just laid it out there, you know, just boom. And the eyes were like, uh, yeah, what? I can imagine. <laughs> they were like what? And, you know, so we did a few classes and it went really well. Um, on the end of the school year celebration, um, a mom came up to me and said, um, my son um, wants to do Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. And you can probably imagine because of the foreshadowing whose mom it was. It was the eye roller putts <laughs> that I was <laughs> hoping was never going to come to class. But he was amazing. And another mom came up to me and there was another boy um, that really wanted to do Taekwondo. And I said, well, I said, I've looked, I said, for schools, I'll look again. If I find anything, I'll let you know. And they were like, no, you don't understand. They want to take it with you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, uh, <laughs> I've never, you know, haven't done anything for a while. You know, uh, let me, let me think about it. And so I did, I thought about it all summer. Um, and so at this time, so when my daughter was born, I was sort of a stay at home mom. I figured out a job to work from home. Now my son's along, um, you know, I substitute teach at their schools, um, work from, you know, still working from home full time and like, okay, now I'm going to add this Taekwondo thing. <laughs> um, but it, it worked. I decided to go in and I said, okay, because I had this nagging thing hmm. that, um, especially, you know, this mom was like, you don't understand. He hasn't done anything in, in so long. He, um, his, uh, step brother, I think it was a step brother had, um, committed suicide hmm. and, um, he had just never really recovered from that, but this was the first time he was excited about doing something. And so I felt it in my heart that, you know, if you have students, then you have to teach. Um, I think usually it goes the other way around. <laughs> you become a teacher and then students come, but that's just not how it worked. Right. So that fall, I said, okay, you know, I taught right there at the school um, in the big room, which was about the size of somebody's kitchen. Um, and I taught two classes. I split it up, kindergarten and first graders and second and up um, and had a total of eight kids. Mm -hmm. And um, that boy was was one of them. And as it started to grow, um, I decided to, okay, uh, maybe I should go rent a space so I can have more people. Cause if I'm going to do this, I may as well mm. do this. And so I went out and rented space. Then I had a mom say something about, I'd like to do classes. I'm like, you know, you'd be the only adult, right? She's like, yep, I don't care. So that was my first adult in class. And so it just kind of, you know, started to grow, um, and uh, moved, I think, three or four locations in Middlebury to get to a point where, you know, it was it worked with the people I was renting and the space worked and everything else. Um, and uh, stayed with one location for a while and um, was still working uh, the full time job. So I want to go back that moment where you're in the office and you're asking you know, I, I can, I can almost see this. You're asking, so you're going to have the kids do Taekwondo tomorrow. No, no, it's Tai Chi. 
and wheels started turning. Do you do you remember what you were thinking or what you were feeling in that moment when you said, if you ever need anything? Yeah, I was I was reaching. I I, I felt like there was a uh, somebody threw me a line Mm. and I fell for it. Hook, line and sinker, sinker, you know, um, to just uh, be able to do that. And um, it was like coming home. You know, it it really was. And, um, you know, when you teach and especially you something like this, even in a short period of time, you can just see that you open their mind to a totally different system a totally different i don't even know what to call it, world you know where you know especially when you're working with these these kids that are not in a public school setting where you know you stand in line and you do this and you do this and you know i went in there and it was like you know no you're standing here and you're standing here and i don't care what you you know what you you know you do it and you make them accountable for what they're doing and they just eat it up mm. and you know, which has always surprised me. Um, what was the thought process over the summer? You said you spent the summer kind of contemplating whether or not you were going to do this. And, and the way you <laughs> set it out, uh, you know, the way I'm imagining is you're talking to these these couple of moms, you're reluctant, you're nervous, you're, you're pushing back a little bit. And yet we, what you just talked about was you stepping towards it. So it's, okay, ooh, now this thing that I think I wanted, that I told myself I never wanted again is here and I'm I'm, I'm trying to create some distance. So talk about the summer and your deliberations. So the fact that I said husband won, you know, that there was also, there well, was I, all, I, I know, I know. I mean, yeah, I know yes, husband there was, too, there was so. a husband too, but I had to say husband won because obviously that did not work out. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was that piece. I was I was still married at the time, um, but there was tension there. Um, there was um, different expectations that we both had on like raising kids and that sort of thing, and what my role was, and you know how much money I was bringing in, and mm-hmm. you know that whole kind of piece. And it was also going to mean that. Um, he would have to pick up um, our son um, at uh, preschool because I wouldn't be home to do it. And so whether or not he could do that, leave the farm and go pick him up and, you know, how much tension that was going to cause and, you know, how much time was it taking me away from the house? And, you know, those kinds of questions were coming up and whether or not I wanted to open that can of worms again. You know, it was fun what I did. Do I really want to buy uniforms, do this? And plus, how do I do it? Because by this time, it had been eight, nine years? About that, yeah. You know, um, I still talk to the Dians, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. Because we still had that, like, weird things that we never Mm -hmm. said. So I'm like, okay, how do I even do this? And did you I, did you bring it to them? Did you ask them? I did not. Um, for a while, I didn't because I didn't want to bother them with it. They were they had left Vermont. They were running their own school in South Carolina, um, you know. And I was just like, it wasn't really a thing yet. And so you know, see if I can figure it out. So I had to figure out like, what was I going to charge? Um, I had to figure out where was I going to buy things. Um, you know, cause I was starting from scratch. I had no yeah. one to, you know, coax me through. How was I going to write up a contract? Um, you know, all those kinds of things. So it was like, do I really want to go down this rabbit hole? Mm-hmm. And then do I have the time? Do I have the energy to do it? Um, didn't want to disappoint kids, you know, cause they had their whole, you know, Oh, we're going to do this thing. Yeah. So there was a, there was a lot. Um, I'd say probably, um, my Tata really helped me because she wanted to do it. And so, you know, it, that was sort of the thing and she thought it would be really cool to do. And so that was probably the thing that got me over the hump was mm. the fact that, you know, my daughter wanted to, wanted to do it. And so for 10 years, you were part-time. 10 years, I was part-time. In that 10 years, um, got divorced mm-hmm. um, and 
I was still only using one school um, when we separated and um, he was going to have the kids on Saturday mornings. I realized, well, I could do one of two things. I could stay home and cry mm -hmm. because I miss my kids because um, I had them all the time. Or, um, well, maybe I'll go and try to open up another school. Mm -hmm. So I started teaching in my second location on Saturday mornings. And I stayed with the two locations while I was working full time. And then I would dabble in some after school programs. I was very fortunate to have a job that, um, you know, especially uh, after the divorce, the company I was working for was part time. They created a full time position for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I could do some from home. So I would actually like get up at four o'clock in the morning before the kids did do a couple hours of work at home get them, get them to school, go to the office. Um, they'd allow me to leave at like three, two thirty-three, so I could get to my, you know, to my classes and my after school programs and come home and put the kids to bed and do some more work and whatever. So they were very, very flexible. And that was the only way I could do it. Right. Um, and, uh, and I kept doing that for, for a long time. But you reached a point where that, where you said, I, I'm going to teach full time. There are a lot of people that I bet are, are listening to this saying you had the best of both. You had the income from a quote real job that you were responsible for providing the income. And, you know, you're teaching, you're doing the thing that you love and it's probably making you some money And between the two. That's a pretty great combination. Why would you want to change that? <laughs> uh, I probably struggled with that for about a year. I was both careers were kind of neck and neck mm -hmm. um, where I was at uh, a good position where I was working full time, mm -hmm. um, probably able to go into a management position um, was sort of like the, the course. And, but then the Taekwondo thing was really taking off. Mm -hmm. um, and I was finding that between, I was working way more than, you know, 20 hours at the Taekwondo thing with, you know, because I still did back then. I did a lot of um, advertising. Uh, I did a lot of um, demonstrations. I did a lot of so there was a lot of outside work. You yeah. know, teaching is a very small part of of having a school. You have all the other stuff right. um, that you have to do. And um, I was probably close to going mad, <laughs> crazy mad with you know everything up in the air. Um, it was. It was really a difficult decision until, again, a management change. Only it wasn't on the Taekwondo side. It was on my full-time job. And um, this person that they hired was um, the ultimate bully mm -hmm. as an adult. Um, bullied um, the uh, people who worked in the office. Um, you know, just bullied his way. Um, he did... Basically, he he did part of my job that he shouldn't have, and I was mad, and I brought it up to the powers that be, and they were like, I was totally right, but they couldn't have disgruntled employees, so I, so I was disgruntled because he did something. And it was okay that you were disgruntled, but they yes, it was. It totally was because you know he was who he was, and so I finally decided that I didn't need this, mm. and so you know put in my resignation and got done there. And then I was like, okay, now <laughs> I got I teach four nights a week, a couple of after school programs, and I have two children, and I have mortgage. And they have private you, school. You did some and, quick math and said, wait, this doesn't work. <laughs> this does not work. <laughs> it does not work at all. Um, so that's when I really started kind of trying to think outside the box mm -hmm. because a lot of um, martial arts schools teach in the evenings and afternoons. But you have this whole daytime where, you know, I was supposed to be working. And so I started getting a little um, creative and uh, um, reaching out to um, preschools and going to teach at preschools and going to do um, 
uh, teaching gym classes and, you know, back, you know, uh, I wrote, I did like a letter and sent them to every school in the district. And, you know, I would send letters to um, pediatrician offices and I would send letters to guidance counselors and I would send, you know, and just throwing it out there and just hoping something would stick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, fortunately it, it did. Um, and so that's where it kind of started to come around and, you know, it, it seemed to have worked. Okay. How long did it take for you to be able to, let's say, breathe financially? You know, okay. All right. I, I didn't just ruin my life. Oh, uh, last year, probably. <laughs> okay. Probably right. took five years, okay. four or five years. Yep. Yeah. It's a long time, but at the same time, it's also not. Right. Um, because yeah, you were I... figuring some stuff out. You know, one of the things I think the audience needs to understand is we live in a pretty low populated area. You know, the, if, if we add up the population of all the towns that you're teaching in, 25,000? Mm. More cows. Oh, there's certainly more cows. <laughs> but I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to do, because Middlebury is the biggest... Right? And what's the population of Middlebury? I don't know. It's not a lot. Not a lot. So, so, you know, we're not talking about building these programs in cities. We're talking about you having to be so deeply immersed in the community that it just becomes automatic that, oh, martial arts, Master Thomas. And that's a big reason why um, I didn't buy a building or rent a building. So I'm uh, Taekwondo on wheels, I guess you could almost say, yeah. you know, because I rent space and I only rent it for the time that I'm there teaching. And so I travel everywhere um, because uh, individual schools on their own are not that big. But when you combine four schools, right. that's what I need. Um, and they're not going to travel in Vermont, people have to travel a lot for work. The last thing you want to do is travel from work to home and then travel another 30, 40 minutes right. to go to your kid's class. You know, and, and I'm not, I, I know some things because, you know, we have conversations and I'm not going to disclose anything, but I will say that if I'm remember, if, if my understanding is correct, if we add up the, the schools you have in the way that most people would think of, this is my school, you have the biggest school in Vermont. I think that is true. Could be. Um, so if I look at what I call my regular students, and those are the ones that come at night so that they have, they pay individually. Sure. Um, I'm about 250 students now. It's a lot. That's a lot in an area where, you know, I know plenty of schools that have 20. Right. But like I said, you know, each one has like, you know, 50, 60 right. students. Right. So that's why I had to do what I did um, Mm -hmm. is knowing that I would never get that number. Not that I knew there was a certain number I had to get to, but I knew, you know, 30 students was not going to put food on the table for my kids. Um, You know, you probably had more than that when you quit your job. (laughs) Yeah. So, and then the other programs that I run, they pay me by the class. And so usually this during the school year, there's probably a hundred um, preschoolers and after school kids I see. So it's a lot of impact. You know, when you, you talked about that, if we kind of bring it back full circle, you talked about that impact. You talked about the impact that it had on you. You talked about the impact that you wanted it to have on your daughter. Is that still what drives you? It is. Um, the whole reason I teach you know, especially when we're talking about um, tournaments or testings or whatever. I said, you know, my whole reason of teaching is to help increase people's self-confidence and self-worth because I lacked that growing up. And um, my older students, I, I will share with them that, you know, I was I was suicidal all through um, high school and college and in fact was a cutter in college. And, you know, I tell them Taekwondo saved, saved my life. It was the one thing that I felt good at 
and in college it got bad but by then miss i was teaching kids and i knew you know it sounds awful but you know you you if you read enough you and you know the impact that a suicide what kept me from following through um and so i want to make sure that uh kids know or even adults because the adults needed help too that there is a place that they can come and be loved and be supported and um i tell my students all the time i'm i'm so blessed because i trained in a great school i loved it but there was there were egos there was bickering there was you know stuff but i don't have it i, I don't have the drama and, and I want to talk about that because that's a subject that, you know, of course, you listen to the show. You know that we talk about that on the show seemingly every third episode, at least. <laughs> and it's a subject that you and I have had a lot of personal conversation about in our strong distaste for that and what it leads to. So how do you keep that out of your school? I think... Um, we, I did away with a lot of um, bowing, traditional bowing that I used to do when I went to school. Um, we don't bow to the space. Um, we only bow to whoever's teaching class, like whoever's starting class and whoever ends class. And we bow to each other when we're working with partners. But like we don't do this whole, like if I have somebody else start class, I don't make them all bow back into me because mm -hmm. they already bowed. And um, when you come into a space, I feel bowing is for people, not for space. Sure. I probably would, if I had my own building with the flags and everything else, maybe I would do it differently, but maybe not. Yeah. Um, and even though now it's kind of tricky because we've had this conversation too with, you know, using um, uh, pronouns like, sure. um, I guess not for a sir or ma'am or Mr. or Miss. Everybody is called that, even the youngest kid, you know, three-year-old, three-year-old Jeremy would be, uh, Mr. Jeremy, what do you think? It's, you know, The respect or, goes in both directions. It both it's ways. not one way both ways and everybody is sir or ma'am or bucks um and it's just for everybody you don't have to be a certain level to be given that same greeting or that same um courtesy um we don't i don't have people bow to all the black belts as soon as you see them you know because we're just like everybody else um and i think that's that may be part of it. Um, I, right I think from it's the a big part of it. You know, right from yeah. the get go. Um, I don't really talk about my rank much. I did more so. Um, again, if we talk about, you know, being a, a woman running a school, um, that'd be one of the things that, you know, how do you match up to the rest of the schools? Um, but it doesn't seem that important to me anymore um a lot of it has to do with the people you have gotten i've connected with through whistle kick and realizing oh you know it it's important but it's not all that it needs to be um and everybody seems to support each other and come together and yeah mm, i'm just lucky I think it's more than luck, but it's okay. So what's next as you look into the future and your life as a martial artist? Oh, I was wondering if you were going to ask me this question. <laughs> um, my future is probably different than most that you have um, interviewing. Um, I am hoping to be moving to Florida next year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've had a lot of um, well, I have fibromyalgia mm -hmm. and I have osteoarthritis, mm -hmm. which um, I've already had three hip replacements, just had a knee replacement. The other one needs to be done this year. 
and the shoulders on its way out. Mm. Um, I just can't handle the weather up here. And I always tell people that, you know, my, my heart and mind was built for Taekwondo, but obviously my body was not. Um, I just have bad joints. I don't know why. Um, so I'm actually hoping um, that I will have people lined up um, to continue running kicks um, and that they'll still be, you know, um, planting seeds and growing confidence and stuff like that. And um, I'll be stepping out. Mm -hmm. um, hope, you know, we were actually talking, it's not going to, you know, uh, maybe Tai Chi down in, in Florida, something. I love the movement. I love the groups. Um, but unfortunately, now with um, husband number two, um, it didn't bother me that I was never home for dinner. Mm. Um, I'm gone every Saturday morning because uh, I teach about 25, 30 classes a week. Um, now it makes a difference. You know, um, it's, it's time for me to have some time to go out and enjoy. I don't think I sat on my deck once last summer, um, you know, and uh, it's going to be the hardest thing I've ever done. Every time I look at these kids, you know, and I'm like, um, but everything happens for a reason. And I have to believe that, you know, I've done this part and now it, I have to start taking care of myself before right. I can't walk anymore. Right. Well, I, I think I've said this before and I'll, I'll say it publicly. I give it a year. You'll be down there a year before you're teaching <laughs> at most. Somebody, somebody will find out and they'll say, Hey, can you teach my kid? <laughs> And you'll take some time to contemplate and you'll go, okay. Yeah. Well, if I feel better, you know, maybe, maybe. Sure. Sure. And, and and my understanding, you didn't, you didn't mention it, but my understanding is that's why Florida is that when you've spent time down there that you're, you've felt physically much better. When I'm there, um, I don't hurt. Yeah. When I'm there, I can sleep. Those, um, those are two pretty, two pretty massive signs. Yeah. 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 Um, up here, something always hurts, and I can sleep about an hour and a half at a whack. Mm -hmm. um, and then up and adjusting and trying to go back to sleep. So it's hard. I, I can only imagine. But look at what you've done with it. Incredible. How do you want to end? What do you What do you want to say to the audience today as we fade out? Mm. Um, the best teaching advice I ever got was from Mrs. Dion and she said, always teach with your heart. That's the most important thing. Um, and I also want to remind people that, uh, making sure teaching self worth, um, is also, I believe more important than skill mm. because, if you don't feel you're worth fighting for, even with the skills, you're not going to do it. So to nurture both, um, let them know that they're loved and cared for and they're important. And that'll help them also defend themselves and stick up for themselves and move forward. I really hope you enjoyed this conversation. I had a great time talking to Master Kelly. I hope you had a good time listening or watching. And I hope that whether you're a new student or a longtime instructor, you found some value in there because she talked about a lot of stuff. There's a lot of detail in there that I'm wondering if everyone picked up on the first time through. This might be one that you go back and listen to again. I want to thank Master Kelly for coming on. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. It doesn't tend to go that long before I have a conversation with her. To all of you out there, remember, if you want the full deal, all the show notes, you go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're there, you can sign up for a newsletter. You could leave a tip. That's one of the things you can do over there. And if you want all the stuff that we're doing, you want to buy something at the store, whistlekick.com, podcast 15. Don't forget, we offer consulting to martial arts schools. We do a really good job 
helping schools grow, identifying the roadblocks that are keeping you from the revenue or the student counts that are your goals. Because guess what? Every martial arts school isn't the same and one size fits all solutions, they don't work. You can also consider joining our Patreon, go into the family page, or if you wanna have me out to teach a seminar, that's also an option. I enjoy teaching. I was just at a seminar, teaching a seminar that over the weekend, had a lot of fun. But that takes us to the end of another episode. If you've got guest suggestions, reach out. Topic suggestions, reach out. Jeremy at whistlekick.com or for any of the other reasons that we talked about. Our social media, everywhere you can think of is at whistlekick. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.